So I want to welcome, um, we have a bunch of additional people this week. Um, so welcome everyone coming aboard. Um, and then, um, so this week we're gonna go over clinical pathology. Um, and then I'm just gonna review um, a few things obviously on Canvas that you guys might have questions on. Um, so here is actually, do, do, do. I'm going to share my screen with you guys. So I have right now, let me show you your student view one so you can see it because right now I can. All right. So you guys can currently see all of this stuff on here. Um, so you'll have like your resources here. Um, this uh, Sunday study um, session link. So you can come and, you know, obviously you have the link on your email, but if you, for some reason, misplace that, uh, that email or anything, you can at least just log in um, to Canvas and you can look up that study session link. So just by coming in here and then seeing that, you know, here's that link to be able to log in. Um, and then um, here are all of our domains. So obviously um, not all of our domains are listed as to what you're starting with. I will show you guys the syllabus in what, um, in what order that we're currently on. So because we're on a rotating schedule with certain people, um, there are dates and stuff like that that we have within our syllabus. So, um, currently we are on, oh, sorry, we should be on animal, which one did I, I said we were doing, talking in all crazy terms here today. So, we actually should be on animal care and nursing and zoo analysis, so. I apologize. We're, we're a little bit behind. So we're actually supposed to be talking about animal care and nursing. So um today. So we're a little bit behind um just from missing, you know, one of our weeks and stuff like that. Um I'm gonna update this um and then we'll be talking about laboratory procedures and stuff like that next week. Um last week we talked about surgical nursing. Um, and everything as well too. Um, and then we'll kind of go through this list as well. Okay. Um, what did I tell you guys last week to work on? Did I tell you nursing or did I tell you lab? You said lab. Okay. Lab. Okay. Yeah. So if you guys did lab, we'll go over lab this week. I'm like, wait, I think I told you guys lab. So we'll go over lab today and then I'll update our, our syllabus. Um, so I used to have it where lab was right after nursing and then somehow I flipped it in here. So, all right. So good. At least I told everybody, even on the, our newer group that it was lab too. So, um, and then as you get towards the bottom, okay. Um, so you'll see all of these like little links and stuff like that on here. So in lab stuff, there's of course, a lot of different um, links and, and all of that. You guys can obviously download all of these things too to keep them like resources. Um, but there are kind of some subsections as well. Um, there was going to be some quizzes for you too to take. With the quizzes, um, I give you guys multiple opportunities to take them. The idea behind it is that take them um, and you might not do the best the first time around, um, which is fine, but try to take some notes even and say like, you know, I don't understand this question, you know, even after researching on my own. And that's where we come back. If, you know, you come back to uh, talking on Sunday with me and the group and everything and, uh, you know, ask those questions and say, hey, you know, after 
you know, I did some of my research and uh, watching some of the videos and, you know, looking at through the, the books and stuff like that on my own, I still don't really understand this question. Um, so can you help me understand this one a little bit more? And then we can talk through it. Um, and then you guys can go back and try those quizzes again and see how well you do. Okay. Um, so that's why I want you guys to like be able to try those quizzes as many times as possible, just to make sure you really understand the material. Um, and then we have for large animal, um, large animals, not really a domain. Um, so I still don't want to ignore large animal though. So I just have a lot of resources for a large animal so that you guys can kind of study that itself um, and feel a little bit more confident um, in, in large animal, um, especially with, you know, we have some confidence of like, what's our normal TPR for dogs and cats and that type of thing, but what's truly our normal TPR for, you know, a camelid or for our equine and, and things to that nature. So I have all of that stuff in there. And then we dedicate um, a week just straight to medical math. Um, we still do some medical math here and there for other things too. Um, but from, you know, my experience with doing this, a lot of people um, have a lot of questions when it comes to math. So I wanted to dedicate some time to that. Um, and then emergency and everything. Uh, there's a new domain on communication. Um, it's essentially just they pulled out a lot of the questions that we've had um, sporadically in a lot of the other domains and they just pulled it into their own domain. So it's really not um, anything to me. It's not that much to worry about for you guys. It's a lot of like, how would you you know, describe this to a pet owner, um, you know, how it like discharge instructions and, you know, how would you communicate these certain things or what does this mean? How would you say it in layman's terms and stuff to that nature? So it's, it's really not, um, as I think, um, too, too much difficulty. Um, and then I do have um, a VTNA like preview for you guys. I am creating a couple other ones for you currently. So I'll have those up for you guys too. Um, and then our current study sessions are up here. So I'll put those up as we go through. Um, and then I have some older ones as well um, that you guys can also preview. So I'll have those. All right, so those are all at the bottom. All right, so I'll update that syllabus for you guys so you actually know where we're currently at um, as well. Okay, um, obviously you guys can go in and see, you know, if you guys are missing anything and kind of need to catch up, there's gonna be some, you know, homework in here too, um, just to kind of test your knowledge as well and kind of, hey, do I need to review um, some stuff out of our, our current books um, and, and kind of take some notes and then submit that. Um, there's some discussion-based things in here too, just to kind of see, are you really comprehending some of the information rather than regurgitating um, those types of things too. All right, let me read the chat. Uh, yes, everything is multiple choice. So that's kind of nice. Um, okay. Um, the first day. Okay, so it's your first day. Which one should I start with this week? Week one on the syllabus. All right. So as your first day, um, kind of like take everything in today in lab. Um, and then our next week um, is going to be, we're going to flip flop this week. <laughs> on syllabus this week and next week. So this next week coming up, we're going to do animal care um, and nursing. Um, so um, essentially what you'll do starting today after today's is that you're going to focus on animal care and nursing just like everyone else. Um, and so really anyone who's starting fresh today, you're going to take in everything fresh from lab 
um, and, you know, take it all in. Um, we come back to lab uh, and, and clinical lab and stuff like that. So today is just kind of taking it all in. Um, and so essentially you'll end on clinical lab later. So you can always still go back into clinical lab at any time if you want to, but you don't have to necessarily start with anything, but you're going to actually work this week on animal care and nursing. Um, and you're always welcome to work on, you know, any of the domains um, throughout your time. Um, but the main focus for the week is get through the one that we're working on. Um, and then if you have extra time, you're always welcome to do anything extra, especially if you know like you have another week coming up down the road that you're gonna be super, super, you know, busy. Um, you can always do some additional things too as well. So you guys know your schedule better than me. Um, so good. Um, great. I want to make sure I get everybody's. So first week too. So everyone getting all the domain topics just at different times. Yes. So essentially everyone start, everyone's working on the same domain at the same time right now. It's just that we have people start, we have people right now that has started maybe last month. Um, and we have some people that started two months ago, um, or three months ago, or sometimes six months ago. So for that reason, um, it's kind of this nice rolling effect, which can be really nice for you guys because some sometimes these individuals can be really helpful in your guys' studying too, um, especially if you're just really brand new in this. Because again, you guys have already, even in the chat, that can be really helpful in answering some of your questions on top of it. So um, yeah, so, you know, I really like this because it becomes a good group for studying too. You guys get to know each other. Um, and you know, you're it's a good group to kind of lean on as well. So, you know, when I was in the school, um it was nice because I had a group of friends that we we studied together and we got through it together, you know, the pain points and the good points and stuff. And so I think, you know, the more and more that we become virtual and um, we go to virtual classes and stuff like that, we become very secluded and we feel very alone in studying and, and completing things. And this to me has been really nice to have people, you know, to help each other. And, and also, you know, you guys are all in this together. So it's kind of nice. Um, how soon after completing the crash course, do you recommend booking the VTE? &E? So, um, you know, obviously for, I think that you guys should truly be taking the VTE &E ASAP right after taking your course. So trying to, um, go, into it with fresh, you know, as fresh as possible because it's fresh in your mind. Most of the people that are are taking their VTE, &E, they have it scheduled, you know, really, really close to like completing the course. So um, you know, just kind of kind of keeping that in mind too. Um so yeah, that's why I try to work with you guys on if you if you have, if you need that a little bit extra time or like a cushion or stuff like that to have it available, just let me know. So, cause I know it might not quite line up, um, to your test, but I want you guys to feel supported. So, all right. Any questions on canvas? If you guys, for some reason have issues getting on canvas, please reach out. Let me know too. Um, Great. So um, let's get started um, with ClinLab things. Any 
any questions that you guys came up with or had issues with? Um, Can we talk about the um, coagulation cascade and the first, what is that, primary and the secondary and the different of the test, the PTT, PT, mm. ACT? Yes. I get confused about that. Yes. Yes, coagulation cascade. Very good. Anybody else? And um, realistically, how much of the parasit like parasites that we have to memorize? There's so many. <laughs> like in most be, it's just list a giant like many pages of names and stuff. Um. I just don't know how to memorize them. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot. And I think, you know, that's where even as educators, we uh, it's frustrating on our end where we're already trying to advocate for, you know, um, at, at AAVSB level to have them narrow it down a bit of what where our focus really should be um because it's not just you know uh that you need to know the parasite itself but like about the parasite like things to that nature like treatment and those types of things and the intermediate host and you know all of that stuff so um but yeah we can go over like some of the parasites and some of the parasites that I would I would personally focus heavily focus on um so that you would you could at least know what direction to go um If we could go over um, the arterial blood gases and um, what else, the urine cast, those two would be helpful. When you say arterial blood gases, do you mean like, like pH, like all of that and like metabolic acidosis and all of that stuff? Um, sorry, that and the, um, let me, hold on, I'm pulling up the page that I was just looking at right now. I guess like the procedure for sampling too. Oh, okay. Perfect. Anybody else? I have a question. Yeah. Are we allowed, I don't know, like, if I can go over it with the entire group, but if I have some questions about past, like, questions on my vt &E, can I share those with you, or is that not allowed? Yes, you can share them with the me. Um, okay, not and the then, group, though. Yeah, yeah. Okay, because I saw that that wasn't allowed. You're not allowed to, like share that information but like yeah. a lot of stuff that I've I've taken it twice already and a lot of stuff that I've seen I don't really understand because there's more than one right answer yeah you got to pick the best answer right <laughs> thank you yes of course yeah um yeah I mean that's the hard part, right? We, um, and it, it goes even into if anyone goes to take their, uh, if you go to specialize, um, and do your VTS. Um, so I worked towards my, um, 
for emergency and critical care. I work towards my VTS in that. Um, and obviously I'm not a VTS. So um, that's a whole other long, long story. But essentially um, I had emergency surgery due to, um, I was four months pregnant at the time. I was a surrogate. And um, in the middle of my test, um, you know, I wasn't really feeling that great that morning, but I thought it was all nerves and stuff like that. But um, I had to leave my test in the middle of it because um, I had to have an appendectomy. Um, and obviously it's high risk because you're pregnant. So um, yeah, I had to leave in the middle of the test. But um, those tests are truly like, the answers are all correct <laughs> and you have to pick the best answer. Um, and they put, they put the VTNE to shame for sure of just how complicated it is. So. And then do you do like have any tips on like test anxiety and all that? Yeah. I mean, um, we can definitely go over a lot of those testing tips. Um, I think I have a document somewhere that was floating. I don't know if I have it on our actual VTNE prep page or if I put it, I don't know where I put it or if I put it on the crash course page, but I have to find it of just like some test anxiety tips. Um, I mean, honestly, um, one of my biggest things, because we all have test anxiety, right? To some caliber or another, um, I mean, I don't know that anyone goes into a test and is like, oh, it's just another day at the office, right? But um, the biggest thing is we get in the habit of just going through the test and maybe we get to a point where we're, we get one question that's really flustering us or whatever. And um, we need to kind of stop ourselves at at a point and then start grounding ourselves. And literally meaning that we need to feel the space around us. So, you know, whether you put your hands on, on the desk, put your feet on the floor and literally just feel the space you're in. Um, and then practice kind of that like boxed breathing or just breathing in and taking those slow breaths you know out um or you might see people just like taking in those deep breaths and like just shaking all that tension out of them um and just taking a couple moments you know yes you have three hours to take that test but it is plenty of you can take that time to, to relax. You know, there's plenty of time for you to take that time to relax. Okay. I mean, again, I don't recommend people going back in their test and recorrecting answers, right? Go with your gut of those answers, because the more that you go back and change your answers, that's part of your test anxiety that you made a mistake somewhere, right? I mean, yes, go back and make sure that you have answered every single question, but don't go back in and change all the answers. So, I mean, those are like my top tips, but I'll make sure that I have like that, that document for you too. So also make sure you go in and you've had a good meal ahead of time, you know, like you're nice and relaxed going in. Don't like study all night long and study the morning of like, take care of yourself the day before, pamper yourself, that kind of thing too. So what do you think of the, like skipping the questions that you absolutely stump you and then go back, back to them? them? Yeah. I think that's perfect. Cause you're going to start stressing all over that. And it's just going to like get you down for the next ones. Yeah. So what is your opinion on taking the test at home versus at a testing facility? Um, I think it's just depends on the person. 
Um, if you really, 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 really cannot take it at the testing facility, um, then absolutely that's, that works. The problem with taking it at home is that I've heard of, uh, people having issues with taking it at home and, um, that, their computer hasn't worked out for them and they've lost out on money. Um, you know, like being that they, they said like, Oh, your computer doesn't work. So now you have to repay for the exam or, you know, not that they were cheating, but like their, the program software thought that they were like, they shut, they sh essentially shut down the test. Right. And so to me, if I have test anxiety, I would just be like worrying over the fact that like, is this going to be shut down? You know, it just adds another layer of stress to, to me. So I think it just kind of depends. And then you also have to like worry about like setting this whole thing up at your house, you know, like for myself, I would rather just go to the testing facility and take the test, you know? So I don't know. I think it, it all just depends. I also have a very, very loud house. Um, you know, I have kids and animals and whatever. I know that I wouldn't be able to do that. So I mean, you guys know who've been in in my course for a while. Like, my dogs bark all the time, so. Is this course 12 weeks? Yep. But like I said, there are some people that, I mean, I've had a student that has been in my course for over a year before. Quick question. Yeah. Um, so say like I started today, so my course is still going to be 12 weeks, even though I didn't start like everyone else did at the same time. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's all, all individual based. So, you know, whenever someone starts, regardless, you, your course is 12 weeks. Do you recommend that I um, review the material that everyone else reviewed the previous weeks? I mean, you will review it when you when it rolls around your end. Oh, okay, perfect. Yeah. So we will go back to it. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So it it is a revolving, like a revolving cycle of of a course. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know. Um, essentially all of our 10 domains go on you know a schedule essentially and because people are coming into the course every four weeks and so you know some people came in and started with you know pharmacology and then four weeks come around some people come then when they come in they're going to be doing clean lab and then from there they're going to be you know coming in and doing gosh diagnostic imaging I don't know but it's all going in a circle essentially so okay. by the time we come around you know everybody's kind of picking up and and doing that kind of stuff so but to me it's fun because then you guys that have already done it, it completes the cycle of learning to me because you guys are like, oh, I already know that. I can help them with that answer. And then you're like, oh, I get it. Because I just learned that. Especially if you get the math problem, right? Those CRI problems. I love CRIs. See, everybody, now you go, who's it go for CRIs? <laughs> I just took the test and I studied on vet tech prep and it was my favorite thing ever so <laughs> <laughs> perfect see Can you recommend um like doing clever orca because I bought that I didn't think that vet tech prep helped me with my last two exams um because I just kept memorizing all the answers mm -hmm. 
I did buy Clever Orca. Do you think that I've heard that there's false information on there though? Um, I I found several uh misguided and and incorrect information. Yes, on Clever Orca. Okay. Yeah. Are there other studies? Um, sorry, I just got over COVID. Oh, I was like, yeah, you sound different. Um, is there other programs that you wouldn't recommend? Because some people really don't like VTNE prep, and other people are like, oh, it helped me so much. But I'm still kind of, I don't, this is gonna be my third time, and I really, really. I don't some want people to some people don't like VT and E prep like this or vet tech prep. That yeah, the vet tech prep. Sorry. Oh, okay. I was like, is that another program that's not like ideal? Because I'm trying to like study as much as I can because this is my third time and I'm just beyond stressed out about it. Yeah, I think people. Um, it's hard because vet tech prep has my. Best Act Prep has had some changes um, over the last several years. Um, and so, you know, Vet Tech Prep was really like a, a strong, strong, um, you know, program for many, many years. And um, my understanding, I should say, my understanding is that they've had some changes over the last couple of years. Um, and so I think that, you know, some of their resources are really great. Like, you know, their power pages are really cool. Um, you know, I think those are helpful. And my, from what I have gathered from some students, just, you know, hearing of that nature too is, you know, and just like someone mentioned is that they find their self memorizing questions versus comprehending material. And so what you're going to see is that people go into the test thinking that they're going to see those same questions on the test. And that's not, that's not what you're going to see. Those questions are never, never going to be on the test, right? Um, the idea behind it is that we're trying to get you guys used to how those questions are going to be phrased for the test. And, um, and then, you know, we want people to be able to fill in the gaps of some of the comprehension or, or, you know, kind of sometimes to it's, you're learning so quickly in tech school that some of those things that you learn so fast, it just didn't quite click yet. And even though those power pages are good, it's just not enough information to get it to click. So I think that vet tech prep is good, but I don't know that it's sometimes enough for everyone. And I do think that that's why it's nice to have all these different test testing places because not everyone's learning is the same. And so we need to be able to go, well, you know, it was good for this person, but it might not be perfect or it might not be good for everyone, you know? Yeah, um, uh, the first time around, yeah, um, I was, I did it out of school. The second time I ended up, um, I did, I did this course, I did the VTNE and I did the workbook and almost everything kind of clicked. But the funny thing was a lot of cases that we had for the month, they were actually on the test, which really helped out, which was yeah. kind of ironic. And then the third time, well, I was sick and I left. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't think. And um, I'm just waiting for the approval yeah. for the refund. And thankfully, they had asked me for a doctor's note, so fingers crossed that they'll give me something back. Yeah. Um, but yeah, don't go take your test, even if you feel better. Yeah. <laughs> it did not help me at all. Yeah. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, 
I think we just have to look at, um, you know, what's going to work for everybody or what's going to work best for your guys's learning. You guys know how you learn best. Like, how did you learn best in school? Um, and then just try to try to match it up with your guys's needs. You know, if you guys are like, look, I'm not learning. I need something better in this program that's going to help me learn. Like, I think that's at least one thing that I can at least try to accommodate because I'm still very small compared to some of the other places that they're so big that they might not be able to be like, well, who are you? Number one, you know, like, so, so if I can build resources to help you, plus I want to be able to grow into something that can be perfect for everyone. So, um, so that's why you'll see, at least for my program, you'll see things like videos and homework and, and quizzes and all different things, because I wanted to fit what each individual can learn best from. Okay, so it does look like a little bit of a chaotic um, learning experience, but it is to try to help how everyone should be able to learn. So, do you have anything of yours? Uh, I'm sorry, um, on like Quizlet or something? Um, I guess. What do you what do you mean by like Quizlet? Oh yes, so I started a Quizlet thing a long, 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 long time ago. Gosh, this is years. Um, but gosh, did you see something on Quizlet? Is that why you're asking? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I was just wondering because I. I'm a kid when it comes to studying like, games is what makes it click me. So like it has like the games that you can play yeah, and whatnot. But I was just wondering if any of the information that we are going to go over on here like, yeah. through you is on Quizlet or not. Yeah. Um. So that's not a bad idea, honestly. So um, I should really re-explore that. Um, so... As you know, when we talk on VTNE prep, our thing is that we don't like typically promote a lot on Quizlet um, because of, and the reason for that is when we use other people's material on Quizlet, we don't really know what's right and what's wrong, right? And that you could be studying someone else's material and then it could be all wrong material, right? However, Quizlet, you're right can be really, really useful, especially if we know that it's coming from a good source. Um, so I really should explore that again, because I I did explore that maybe a year or two ago and start something, but then I pulled away from it and went other directions and forgot about it. So I thought that's what you were referring to. So yeah, let me look at that again. I'll make a note here. Um, to try to try to do something with that. So thank you for that. Um, awesome. Okay, so let's get started actually. Um, since we spent a lot of time on that, um, and talk about our um, we're gonna talk about coagulation cascade first. So, Anyone know anything about coagulation cascade to begin with? What can you tell me about coagulation cascade? I'll say that. People are like, oh, no. No, there's intrinsic versus extrinsic. Great. And I have a hard time remembering in what order 
um, things flow. So the review will be helpful. Okay. There's a lot to it, right? Let me find something. Oh, this one looks kind of cool. But it's too complicated. Um, I think this one is probably our best bet. Does anyone currently do clotting factors in their hospitals, send them out, do anything to that nature? We usually send them out. Okay. Like our, P our PTTs. We do PT, PTT in-house, but we're general practice, so it's kind of rare. Okay. We do it as a part of our pre-anesthetic profiles. Ooh, nice. Good. My clinic will send out PT, PTT also with our pre-anesthetic profiles. Awesome. I love that. Um... Is there any type of animal that we really are concerned with of clotting issues? Uh, those with von Willebrand disease. Yeah, von Willebrand's for sure, right? Of course, Dobermans. Yes, our poor Dobermans. I love Dobermans, they're so cute. Um. So we have, I don't know that I love this picture. Mm, it's okay. Okay. So um, we have our intrinsic and extrinsic pathway. Um, I always use a different picture and I was like, maybe I'll... Maybe I will try something new. Um. I'll give you guys a couple pictures. Let's try that. So So our um, extrinsic factor is our PT. Intrinsic factor is our PTT. All right. So Essentially, our PT is going to be if we are, you know, seeing any type of clotting issue, you know, it's kind of like that initial, you know, issue with, with clotting, right, that we might see, okay? Um, so... Um, intrinsic, um, we are
obviously starting with a service surface contact okay um where extrinsic is going to have tissue damage factor 10 is where they where they're going to end up meeting up they're both involved now anyone ever see a like rat poison I have, yeah. Okay. Yes. Um. So, do you guys end up um doing clotting factors for those patients? Yeah, we usually do those in house. Okay, perfect. And so, you guys are gonna do a PT and PTT for those as well, right? Yes. Okay. Perfect. So this is the one thing that you guys should know as well is what clotting factors are going to be affected with rat poison. Would it be um fibrinogen? Um, let's see. Not, not your clothes. four numbers I'll say that did you guys learn this in school can't say I that don't, I, have. <laughs> I, don't understand, I don't understand what you're asking can you repeat the question yeah so um if you have a patient that comes in and they um ate rat poison okay mm -hmm. Yes, we are going to check a PT, PTT on them, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what clotting factors, though? Out of those two, the PT, PTT, what are the clotting factors that are, are associated with rat poison that we're worried about? So we already know that it's the extrinsic and intrinsic that we're worried about, but there are certain clotting factors that we're, we're worried a, about. It'd be the platelets, wouldn't it? No. So you know, remem remember, remember, sometimes animals can't clot, but it's not the platelets fault sometimes. I know that it affects the vitamin K, like the factors that vitamin K Yes, so it does. Right, it but... does affect the vitamin K factors. So what are the vitamin K factors? I don't remember. <laughs> okay. Are these numbers you're talking about? Yes, they're numbers. Two, eight, nine, and 10. Oh, good. I wait. have a... No, Is wait. That... Nah. No, you're close. You're thinking of pennies. You're thinking of uh, your clothes. Mm -hmm. it's, you're you're thinking yes. Um, you're close. It is ten, it is nine, and it is two. Not eight. You're so close though. Is it four? No. Seven? Yes, yeah, seven. We'll talk about 
1982 in just a second. Okay, we're going to keep that in our back pocket. Um, okay, so how do I remember this? Okay, because this is a lot to remember. Again, we don't, we don't have a lot of space in our brains. Even though we are very smart individuals, it is hard to remember vitamin K factors. All right. How I remember this is 1972. Okay. So to get 19, I just, why, why did I put this 19 there, right? Instead of the 10 and the nine is that I just said 10 plus nine. Okay. Is 19. So that's my 10 and nine. All right. And then seven and two. Okay, so that was just my way of remembering. Vitamin K factors is 1972. Okay, so that's how I just associate my vitamin K factors. All right, so if I'm thinking of intrinsic and extrinsic factors and what they are, you know, if they ask me those question, that question on the vt &E and says, all right, well, if I, if I have a patient who, you know, came in with rat poison and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, what are the factors that are associated with, for this patient? What is it? What are they going to be? And you're going to say 10972. Okay, so um, that's where we're not able to form, you're right, we're not going to be able to form that stable clot because it's affecting those factors, okay? Our platelets, if we looked at a slide, we might be able to see beautiful platelets there, but we can't form the clot because we actually don't have those factors present. So you might have a patient when they first come in and they're, um, they might have just ingested that, that rat poison um, and their PT, PTT is completely fine, right? So if you guys have already seen that, their PT, PTT is completely fine, but it does take some time, right? So We've seen it later on where they've ingested it and maybe two days later, where's their PT, PTT? Anyone seen it? It's, it doesn't read, right? It's, it's continues to go, especially the PTT. It's like 300 plus in seconds, it's just going and going and going, right? Now, 1982, I put it as a number. So we talked about zinc. So what is that? It comes from digesting pennies. And pennies, right? From what year? 1982. 1982 and before? Before. Yeah. So that's the special number, right? Because pennies were made differently. So has anyone ever seen this? Uh, no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's crazy, right? Yeah, it was a pug. Oh, and, of course. Um, yeah. Um, I'll have to find the picture and I'll send it to you. But they got it. They She went to the specialist and they got it out. Yeah. But like it was still a penny, but you could see the stomach started to digest it because there was like a hole in the in penny. In a hole in the penny. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've seen it uh, quite a few times. And um, yeah, it just eats that penny. But in this case, essentially, that patient starts becoming anemic. Right. So, um, so it's definitely the only way to treat that pet is by taking out the pennies. You know, you can give blood all day. Um, 
to that patient because they're anemic. But the only way to fully treat that patient, because blood is a Band-Aid, um, the only way to treat that patient and get it to stop is by removing those pennies. Okay. Um, so once we have the, we reach to that, obviously our 10th factor, that's um, actually known as our common pathway. Um, so the common pathway is where we are, are at the, uh, the prothrombin, thrombin area um, where we're starting to reach um, the fibrinogen area and stuff too. Um, what do you guys know about fibrinogen as well? It's the basis for a fibrin clot. Right? Okay. Um, what what makes up what makes up our total protein albumin and the goblin Albumin, globulins, globulins. So my thing, the clotting factors. What what clotting factor? Fibrinogen. Mm-hmm. So those three things, albumin, globulins, and fibrinogen makes up your total protein. Um, so again, if you have something to that nature, then then you can know what that means. Um, Miss, so zinc is ten, like the 1982, that's 10982, right? Is so that... for zinc, this is if when you see a penny, right? It'll say on here the year it was made, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So no, this isn't the 10. 10982. This is just the year it was made. This is the only one I made, like its own little special thing, just to remember it. I have sort of a sidebar question. And yeah. only if we have time later. Um, yeah. Could we go over like using total protein um, to evaluate? Pleural effusion and things like that. Uh, total protein to value. I'm sorry, what? Effusions, like if you have, if you pulled abdominal fluid or something, yes. you look at the weak tractometer to figure out transidate or exudate. Yes. That sort of stuff I vaguely remember, but could uh, you help with? Yes. Miss, so course. knowing these, oh, I'm sorry, so knowing these um, in intrinsic pathway numbers, like, I had never seen this in class in school before. So that's something that they'll put on the VTNE. Um, so I think to an extent. So you're probably not going to see, you know, this full cascade per se. Like you're not gonna have to know or or essentially draw this full kind of content. But it's good for you guys to know what the intrinsic and extrinsic does right and um and how it's essentially going to be you know measured or just like in the sense that you know how we are 
how we are getting to where we're getting for certain things, I guess, in, in the sense of like, uh, you know, like rat poison or certain tox toxicities or, um, those types of things. So, um, how we get to the common pathway to actually form, you know, that clot itself. Um, so I think it's helpful for you guys, um, to be able to know that. So, Um, so, you said though, miss, uh, you, you gave a scenario regarding like the rat poison, mm -hmm. like for the BT and E, like they could ask us like what factors 10, nine, seven, two, like those, you know, like they could ask us something like that. Yes. So they could, they could ask like, what, what are your vitamin K factors for, you know, or, or they could say if, if a patient got into rat poison, you know, it's a critical thinking question, you know, like what are those types of things? Most definitely. That's, um, it's crazy. Cause those numbers again, like that was something I was never shown in school like this this test is going to be overkill <laughs> so. i mean and that's where again i think that we need to have a little bit more standardization of our education so so that we are making sure that each school is is teaching you the exact same things so um because to me you know i was taught all of that you know, I was taught about zinc pennies. Um, you know, I don't know how many other people at your schools were taught about vitamin K factors and stuff like that. So, um, you're not alone, buddy. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, or even the clotting cascade to begin with, you know? So, to be honest, I think. For me, at least, I had school during the thick of COVID. Um, yeah. I do think that had something to do with it. Yeah. Um, and so, and I know that we have seen a dip in COVID uh, with BTE &E scores and stuff like that, too. So, you know, is that an excuse for our teachers? No. You know, I don't think that should be an excuse for our teachers to not do a good job with teaching, but, um, but I do feel bad for you guys because that doesn't set you up for success. We went through COVID and in the middle of COVID, we had like a school, like president change. Oh yeah. So the entire vet tech pack faculty quit. Oh my gosh. So yeah. he got them to hold on for like a month or two, like a semester, but it, they had checked out and they yeah. were pretty much like, if you just existed in the class, you got an A. Uh, okay. And then they scraped together like three teachers to finish us out. <laughs> you guys should have been like, do I get a discount on my program for this? We wanted to, but that was not an option because he was crazy. doing a school-wide remodel. So he wanted all the money he could get. <laughs> So, all right. So our intrinsic pathway um, is responds essentially to internal damage of our vascular space. Okay. Um, our extrinsic um, becomes activated when there's external trauma. All right. Um, so those are the main differences. Now, does that mean that in the sense of rat poison, that we may not have both elevated? No, 
But if you truly have rat poison, um, you're going to see more of the PTT be elevated in the end stages, okay, than the PT, if that makes sense. So think of this, at least, that this is external trauma and this is internal trauma. So do you guys need to know, essentially, okay, factor seven is here and factor nine is here? No. Like, that's why I... I have to pull up a picture for you even after all these years because I, I would miss something, to be perfectly honest. Could you give us some examples of what external and internal, like an example that? Yeah, might, yeah. They, they so, might ask you the question that. Yeah, so um, an external trauma could be a hit by car. Right? Um, internal trauma could be DIC or, um, it could be, um, oh, a allergic reaction that is really, really, really bad. Could it also be like the inter uh, internal trauma, like, uh, like a ruptured spleen? Yeah. Yeah, okay. your hemoabdomens. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah. Would I have a Sorry. Go ahead. Would IMHA be considered an intrinsic? Uh, so IMHA is not going to have, so we have to consider IMHA here. IMHA might not have necessarily a, a coagulation issue unless it's Evans syndrome, right? Evans syndrome there has both. It has the ITP aspect of, of that. If you think about it, because it's it doesn't have um, platelets, mm -hmm. right? Um, but IMHA alone is where the immune system is just eating up all of the its own red blood cells. But it's a good thought. Um, now, when we're thinking about platelets, though, in ITP, that's where they just truly know platelets, but who knows, maybe we also have some other things. Maybe they're missing some clotting factors as well. Who knows? Um, so they still do if you are involved in that, right? Um, how many times do you guys still do clotting factors on those ITPs or Evans just to make sure? Probably a bunch, right? I've never seen that at my clinic. I've also never heard of it. Oh, Evans. Okay. So, um, you guys, have you heard of, I'm running out of room already. Are you general practice or are you, uh, ER or specialty? General practice. General practice. Okay. That's probably why. Um, <laughs> I'm like, oh goodness. Um, so I am H A I M H A. Okay. What's I am H A mediated hemolytic anemia immune mediated hemolytic anemia okay how about ITP I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, mediated thrombocytopenia. Okay. Immune mediated. Okay. 
thrombo site. Oops. Kenya. There's one more word. Most people don't say the last word, but. Is it purpura? Yeah. You guys going to be, I never heard that. Just blowing your minds today. If only I had better handwriting, right? P-U-R-P-U-R-A. Most people think that the P from Penia is the P in ITP, but it's not. Now, would I correct you if you were working in a hospital and you were like, it's, I mean, mediated thrombocytopenia? No, because I don't really care. But if we're going to be technical here, <laughs> then that's it. So... We have patients, right, who have IMHA, and, and it's obviously immune-mediated, right? So the idea behind it is that the body is upset with itself, and it's attacking its own red blood cells, okay? So it is is attacking its own blood cells and eating its own red blood cells, okay, making it anemia, or making it anemic. You can have ITP, which it's immune mediated and it's attacking its own platelets, making it that it is not being able to clot. And then also in turn, making it can be anemic because of that too, right? But it's not, it's not hemolytic. But we can also have both together. And that's called Evans syndrome I, um i have um i wonder is there a way that i can share my screen with you guys really quick because i have we had a case of evans before at our clinic uh -huh. and i would love to I, I would love to show you the blood work or what it looked like um does it have the patient's name on it I can erase it. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if you can share. Hold on. Let me see if I can. Let me see if I can give you control. I can, e I can erase everything off, like all of the information and email it to you if you want. Yeah, or if you want to post it on our Facebook group page, too. Because I'm like, yeah, ah, I think I'm being crazy, and I don't know how to do it. Yeah, I can definitely do that. Um, You'll have to like, request to share, and you would have to approve it, because you're the main person. Oh. Oh, I think you have to stop sharing your screen and then oh, okay. Yeah. I was like, I don't see it. So I want to um ask to clarify the primary hemostasis is the platelet, right? Forming the plate the platelet going into the so you are going to have the platelet, right? But the platelet cannot actually form a clot. It's going to need fibrin in order to tie up those platelets together. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So it needs all of that, that cascade to make that fibrin and then tie up those platelets to make that full clot. So if the ITP is about platelet, then it has nothing to do with the cascade. Correct. But okay. sometimes you might have some other issues with that too. So I think sometimes we do have to like 
look at everything. So, so at some, at some point, can we talk about the PT and PTT test? Yes. Because I'm confused yeah. about how, like, how they are. I, I know that one is for in-transit and one is for ex-transit, mm -hmm. but like how they are being done and... Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, let me... I'll talk about that in one second. Thanks. Yeah. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So this... um, I believe she was a young lab and she came in because her stomach started to look um swollen. Um, and so initially they thought it was like bloat or something um but when she came into the clinic she was extremely pale she um had a temperature she was very lethargic and so we did her blood work and this is what it came this was the very first blood work that we did for the initial appointment and so this the first part is her cbc so obviously it's all over the place oh look at her yeah her platelets are so low mm -hmm. And then, and then this is her, um, her chem with some light. Mm -hmm. We just, we just have a simple chem seventeen, so it's not like the whole knit and caboodle. Um, but that was, but that was really it. So of course, um, she survived this whole thing. She's still, she's still going. Um, but she's um, living on pred and of course other medications as of right now. But of course, we initially we started with, um the Chinese herb, mm -hmm. um, she was on that. And then she was on a whole bunch of other things. It doesn't, doesn't say any like permanent information of like decline or anything, but. So if you go back up really quick, mm -hmm. um, the tea belly, right? We see this tea belly being really, really high. Why would that tea belly be so high for this dog? So we talked about this dog had IMHA, right? And then yeah. and then ITP together being Evans. So why is the T Billy so high? From the destruction of all the red blood cells. Ooh, very good. Very good. Yes. And then, you know, ALT is going to be high too, because again, we're number one, ALT is our check engine light for the liver. Okay, so we don't have like our elk foss isn't high or anything like that, but it's indicating like, look, we are we are having to destroy a lot right now in this liver that's not not normal, and we're putting on our check engine light to say something's wrong. Okay, so um, that should be an indicator to a veterinarian to go all right, something's up here, right? Same thing with our, our uh, white blood cells up top that this animal is sick um, and like our lymphocytes are up, um, our neutrophils are okay, but like the lymphocytes are going, mm, this isn't right. And so it's either we have cancer <laughs> um, or um the immune response in this pet is not okay so this is an autoimmune issue okay and so even though sorry and then even though like the neutrophils are not red but you see that neutrophil bands are suspected does that also kind of tell you that her body is like overworking and doing something yeah okay. most definitely yeah very good now, this is a great one to like show. So yeah, her red blood cells are are really low. Her metacrit was 16.8. So even if you guys don't have a range there and you kind of know what that range should be at her metacrit being 16.8, you're going, okay, that's probably not good. Now, you said that her stomach was large, right? Yes. So why would her stomach be large? Anyone have an idea? Did she yeah. have possibly uh, free fluid? I'm sorry, you go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Did she have free fluid in her abdomen? Probably not. Think about okay. think about how um if you have a pet who has a, not a lot of red blood cells, okay? 
What do red blood cells do? Carry what? oxygen. Carry oxygen, right. Very good. So if they don't have a lot of red blood cells to carry oxygen, what do you think this dog was probably doing? Trying to find it elsewhere. The body was trying to find the resources elsewhere. Okay. Or dying. So she was probably trying to breathe in a lot, right? So whether it was panting or whatever. So again, it's called oraphagia. So she was probably just sucking in air and and she probably had a lot of air in her stomach because she was like swallowing air. Hmm. Um, uh, so we see this a lot with animals who uh, have a hard time breathing, whether it is congestive heart failure, whether it is animals who have a anemia. And it can be like we think of them as bloat many times, which technically she could be bloated, but just not torsed. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, this is such a good case to bring up as like <laughs> your traditional Evans or traditional IMHA. Mm, Cause I can't remember if. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was like, yeah. Hi. Yeah. So yeah. Even her, if it's her temps 104 for mm. that, that just indicates like her body's on overdrive right now. So not, not that she has an infection. It's just that she, her body's working really hard. So. Mm -hmm. Did you guys do a blood smear on this dog? Um, I don't think so. Cause I think we stay, cause we're only general practice. So like we stabilized her. And we shipped her off because we can't do um, blood transfusion because that's basically what he like we will stabilize and do what we can. And then he was like, you have to go because like we don't have the resources to continue. And then, of course, after she got her um, blood transfusion, we followed up with her. We did um, at first it was it felt like monthly um, blood work just to make sure everything was was improving and like either it was like thing, little things were improving but she was still really anemic but like she was stable um and like she like she was weird it was weird because but she's living on pred and some other medications um that i don't remember the name of them because we don't normally um use them you won't see any personal information unless i open it but but, is Evan syndrome something primarily in dogs or would is that oh it says azothioprine okay perfect mm -hmm. um so i'm sorry what did you say is it evan syndrome you said yes yes is it primarily dogs yes yes i also see it a lot in white fluffy dogs um so essentially um and, yeah, and what we're trying it. to do in this case so you know she mentioned prednisone right so why would we put this pet on prednisone to suppress the immune system good right we want to suppress the immune system um and um yeah they were probably just throwing anything at that dog with vitamin k <laughs> yeah and then then i don't know what this one does um da, 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 da. that might be let's see it is oh plavix okay um that is also to uh um to help in case oh my gosh it is to help in case of any type of uh oh gosh um for risk of heart disease or stroke essentially so it's essentially like an aspirin um it's not aspirin but it's like an aspirin um, okay 
And so. this was her most recent one. So this was a couple months after, uh, way after. So as you can tell, she's she's it's getting better. Yeah, she still has low low platelets, but it's better. Mm -hmm. Um. So, so yes, they want to um suppress the immune system. So, um, you know, if your immune system is on overdrive, right? Um, you know, prednisone is going to help suppress that. One thing that you can do is um to help produce some platelets is um vincristine is a um is a chemotherapy agent um but um in some lower doses we have used that to um help in red or i'm sorry to help in platelet production again when you give chemotherapy it also suppresses the immune system right so there are People get really nervous, obviously, with chemotherapy, right? You mentioned chemotherapy, even just to some people who aren't used to chemotherapy, even the veterinary field, they're like, oh my gosh, chemo. But chemo, it can be really helpful in a lot of different ways too, um, not just for cancer, right? So um, we use chemotherapy in certain types of emergency settings. We use it even in neurology um, if any of you guys go into neurology, um, and so it can be super, super helpful in those things. We have to remember that steroids as well come with some bad, um, side effects too. And especially for long-term side effects, they're, they're actually not great either. So especially with this patient, this patient's going to have to be on things long-term. So we have to be really cautious, um, now one of the long-term side effects is if this patient is on long-term prednisone, um, that are at higher doses, um, prednisone can cause animals to lose, um, or have muscle wasting in their back, like rear legs and stuff like that. So you have to be really, really cautious. Um, so it's, again, steroids can be really beneficial or a lot of animals, a lot of people, things to that nature. Um, but you can end up getting like steroid induced diabetes, um, all different things. So you just have to be cautious when you're treating these animals that uh, we don't, you know, create other monsters with it. Um, but it, it's really cool to be able to give them other drugs too. So at least steroids is one of the treatments they're giving. Azathioprine um, is another drug that they are giving to you to help kind of, uh, you know, bring down some of that immune response as well. Um, so again, kind of brushing up on some of those drugs too to kind of understand what we're using them for is really nice. Um, but no, that's an awesome case that you guys can learn a lot from. So, um, okay, so when we're talking about PT, PTT, so obviously there's gonna be a lot of different types of machines out there, I, I guess. Um, so I don't wanna get too in the weeds with the machinery because I know that that's not gonna be on the VTNE for you. Um, but when you are doing an in-house PT, PTT, um, you know, you want to bring those tests up to room temperature. Um, a big part of like when you're drawing blood for any type of clotting um, factors too, is that you want to also be sure that when you're taking that sample, that you're not just getting that sample from your patients um, and then just placing that into the test you or I'm sorry placing that into your tube you want to have a good sample um like from a good stick as well so you're not like fishing around trying to get a sample and then you know take it so 
if you have tried to poke that pet several times with the same needle, you may not get a great, um, a great, you know, type of, or an accurate, I guess, um, test. So, um, also you'll have to use at least a 22 gauge needle for, um, the test. Um, and then you also want to make sure that you are filling your tube all the way up. So whatever your tube says to fill it to, you have to fill it up all the way. So if you're using, you know, those blue tubes and they say to fill it to, I don't know, 1.5 mLs or whatever it is in there, or 2.3 or whatever, that you have to fill it to their full amount, okay? So, um, and then... Uh, depending on what type of test that you have, you have to warm it. A lot of times they warm them as well once you place that in there. Um, and then you fill fill up your, your sample and then you let it run. Um, your PT, um, your normal seconds for it is going to be, you know, somewhere between like 13 and 15 seconds, um, something like that. Um and, um, you know, anything more than that, um, obviously that means that we have, you know, some sort of clotting, um, issue in that, that, you know, PT area, um, to let your doctor know of, um, and then your PTT is going to go a lot higher in that range. So you may have like 200 seconds or something like that. So, um, but both of those samples are run the exact same way. It's just the the difference is that one of them is a PT and one of them is a PTT, right? Um, is that kind of what you're looking for? Um, so if we do a BMBT, is it similar to a PT? No, 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 no. So BMBT, um, anyone ever do a BMBT or know what that is? That's when you cut the gingiva right and yeah. you measure how long it's clot mm -hmm. so uh it's called a buccal mucosal bleeding time okay it is highly um out of it's highly dated and not it sh honestly should not be used in practice unless there isn't no other way to to do um a bleeding time Anybody know why? Uh, probably it's stressful for the patient. Um, it's not you manually sure. count. There's nothing. It, yeah, so I, I mean, you, sure. I've done it before in shelter medicine and it's kind of old school and you, you're like counting yourself. Yes. It's not like a machine or anything. Right. So you're manually counting it. Sure. Um, also you, so how are you cutting the lip or the gum? Is it a way to introduce infection it, maybe? It's sure. like a snap. It's like you snap the gums with a little device like you do with your finger when you're yes. uh, yeah, doing so your, checking your iron. Right. So you can buy those um little little like cutting devices things or whatever but not everyone does that right so there's number one issue so some people will use a needle some people use a i've seen people use um like a small little scalpel nick so again inaccuracy on that end okay um where where do you do it? On their gums or on their lip. Okay. So how many people do it on their gums? That's not on the gums, on the lips. Okay. So you guys do oh. it on the, the lip. Okay. Um, And then do you guys tie the lip up or do you just hold the lip up? Just hold it. Anyone ha have tied it? I had to do. I it always thought my... it was just a gum. So, okay, 
You thought it was the gums? So yeah, so inaccuracy maybe of um the location, right? And and also where on where on the lip or where on the gums. And then um, you know, there I have had people and have even done it where we're tying the tie gauze to hold the lip up. So tension of the tie. Okay. And then we're also placing gauze underneath or by it, right, to sop up the blood. So how how are we actually doing that? Can that affect that BMBT as well? Um, so is it gauze or some people use actually like filter paper or things like that? So is that changing our results too. So there's like so many ways to have inaccuracy to this that again, there's just like, it's very out of date method. Like when we didn't have ways to do a PT, PTT, like you did the best you could. But now that we do and we can do something in practice, you know, we can do PT, PTT in practice. Like we just don't have to do a BMBT. It's good to know that like, I think, again, I think it's important to teach that that we once did this, but just like we don't use halothane anymore, we don't have to necessarily use BMBTs if, if at all possible. I can understand in shelter medicine, you know, you like if, if you're in a pinch that you can use it, but I just don't think that we need to. Um, my question is, is that the extrinsic factor? If I do BMBT, would it be similar to the PT that measuring? Oh, the I see. Factor? Um, that would be your, that would be your extrinsic factor. Yes. Yeah. Going to your common pathway. Yeah. So yes, extrinsic and then your common factor. Not, not your intrinsic. Miss, um, regarding the sodium citrate tube, um, I've, I've been told before that you said you need to fill it up to the top. I've been told before that a, a trick to that is once negative pressure stops, that's when you can take it out. Is that the Cor case? Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, just as long. Yeah. So as long as it's filled. So like the the i've seen it where people are like oh i ran out of blood so this is all we get you know but you can't do that unfortunately so um so yeah um also important for you guys to know um for for drawing blood is um the order of of filling tubes Anyone know? Do you mean red tube versus purple tube? Like, mm -hmm. okay. Isn't it purple first and then tiger due to, um, you don't want, I don't know how to word it, but you don't want the needle or whatever to, the additives in the purple tube to affect your tiger. Is that right? Or the additives no, in the tiger to affect the purple? First, right? Blue, purple, red. Nope. I think purple is last. It yeah, purple's last. Because, yeah, because mm -hmm. you don't want the, any the additives to mess up with the other blood tubes. But I think it's, um, mm, that's all I know. <laughs> we do red and then purple. Yep. Yeah. But there's so many other ones in between, so. Green first, and then purple, and then anything else that's left. I get into arguments. With I don't think so I've many ever people about this. <laughs> I've always um, put one sample into the blue, not <clears throat> amongst the. Blue the definitely others. goes first, though, right? Like if you're doing the clotting. Sorry, what goes? What do you say? Go um, first. If if you did need to use the the blue tube, that would be the first one. Well, what if you have to do a blood culture? 
Oh, but we don't ever do blood cultures. Well, sometimes you might. I I say this uh, many times. Uh, <laughs> you're gonna do, you know, probably more sticks. But if you, if for some reason you had to put them all in an order, these are your orders. Where does the yellow top go? The separator? That's urine. You mean the tiger top? Um, yellow and red? Uh, they're just yellow here. The SS is <laughs> teeth. That would be right. probably a red top because it yeah. also has a serum separator. Oh, okay. Yeah, because it, it, I'd exchange the, the tubes. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, so that, that would be right here with these guys. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so the cool thing you can do if you have people who want to argue with you, right, is they have they have little cards that you can get for people, like little things you can put on like um, you know, name cards or whatever. Um they also have people who make because nurses have this issue too. Um, but you can also get like little keychains. I guess guys probably wouldn't want to carry the, these like little cutie keychains around. But, um, you know, like tech week, people are always looking for stuff, you know. So um, you could also get like these little keychains that have the order in here of how to fill your tubes. So here's your yellow. Um, so that could be like a little helpful, but they also have obviously cards to help people as well. So I thought that was kind of nice. Because we have been, you know, doing it wrong for forever. I mean, you know, gosh, when I was in the beginning, we would fill our purple top before our red top. Yeah, so. But I think it's because we just didn't know. So, um, okay. So, um, when we go to parasites I think we talked about this one before has anyone ever gone to um companion animal parasite council Yes, they have a really cool app too. Yeah. Um, so this is definitely my go-to. So it's capcvet.org. All right. Um, so what I really like about this is they also have an area on here as well for, I want to say they have somewhere on here for um or they did oh they had somewhere on here they had some quizzes oh yeah here duh it's right here um so definitely check out their quizzes so if you go to their resource library, um, they also have some reference guides, their maps, all of that. Um, videos. So again, it's just some nice additional things that 
especially if you have some, you know, parasite, parasite problems. Um, um, quick, quick question, sorry. Yeah. For the VTNE, do they give you pictures and say identify the parasite? Uh, they can. Ugh, okay. You know, so um, when I took my VTNE in one, 2007, they did not have pictures. So, um, and, and I took my test, it was on a Scantron. Um, and then we had to wait six weeks for the results, right? Um, but I will say, I kind of wish that we had pictures because instead what they did was they would describe maybe this to us, okay? Or they would describe what a surgical instrument looked like. And so you're trying to picture in your head what they're trying to do. <laughs> tell you so you had to know what like these little things were called you know you had to know every every little detail of what that's called so I don't know I think that like at the time a bunch of people were asking for pictures um because that's what we see in the field so I think that that was helpful how many people nowadays even run flotation fecals? There's still yeah. quite a few. We do. I do. Yeah, we do. Really? Sometimes. Wow. Yeah. We do both. We'll send it out if it's not urgent, but if it's like a chronic diarrhea type of thing and we want to know results then and now, we'll do it in-house. Yeah. So, you know, I think there's even, um, you know, because I was, I worked for AHA for a while and there were a lot of people who, you know, complained over the fact that, you know, you guys had to learn about um, uh, for diagnostic imaging, like how to how to take um, images not using digital, like actually with cassettes and da 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 da, like all of that, and not to, not necessarily developing manual but doing like automatic processing and i was like um yeah because i will tell you at the when i go to visit hospitals still um there even even in 2024 there's still a a reasonable number of people that don't have digital i mean the majority of people have digital, right? But there's still a reasonable amount of people that don't have digital of some sort. Um, I actually was at one hospital in Chicago that still did manual processing, like dipping, which to me was shocking. So yeah, it's, it's pretty it, crazy. It Digital is definitely a game changer. 100%. 100%. You know, like that's so much time out of your day. You know, it takes like 20 minutes to manually process of one film. I yeah. remember when I first started, sometimes it would take me 45 minutes to get the x-rays. Yeah. To an hour just to do x-rays. And now it's like we're finished in 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, I'm starting Maybe. to see the commercials of not letting your pets walk out without knowing what their masses are. And there's like a little, it looks like a price scanner and they put it on the mass and it tells them within like 10 minutes, the results. What? Oh, I, that. <laughs> I saw yeah. that too. And yeah, it's crazy. That. I'm like, why couldn't they invent this 10 years ago? <laughs> I don't know about that. How do they real. know? <laughs> yeah, IDEX is pushing it in our clinic and it's it's pretty expensive. How would they I know bet. that? I don't know. I think um what they were telling us is it's the samples collected and it's digitally scanned and sent to um the lab and they have people 24-7 or something like that looking at it and they'll let us know what it is within minutes oh wait so they're taking an fna of it it's it 
It isn't, it isn't. I think it's like, a, I don't know. I, I, I didn't get the details of it. Um, I just overheard our manager talking about it because he's such a penny pincher. And he's like, it's so expensive. They just say they scan it and that's it. And so I'm not sure if they actually take a little spot of it or something, but it's a little scanner that they put right on the mass and it gets sent to to the lab digitally. So oh, There is like, no oh. way that you can look at it externally and say, that is a mast cell tumor or that is, you know, like, there's yeah, no way. I'm, if I find out what kind of scanner or what the scanner does, I'll try I'm to gonna have to. I'm going to have to quick. look that up. All right, I Idex, it's, mass. Yeah, it's something new. Um, I think it's a year or two or something like that. They've been working on it. I don't know, but they're I'm gonna, digital. <laughs> I'm going to have to look that up. We just got the Imagist. Yeah. And we love it. Yeah. I was, was going to say, one. it sounds like it's the like the vet scan image because you can do sequence uh, location on that and then cytology and then send it out to a pathologist too. So it sounds a lot similar to it. Yeah. There's a new little one too where there where you can do ear slides and stuff now too. Oh, I goodness. saw that one. I saw that on our thing. We It updated not too long ago, but we've not been able to use it. We still just do manual ear cytologies it seems to be a lot quicker for us yeah i mean you know it's nice to be able to have certain things but at the same time it's a way for idex to make more money right Mm -hmm. um and we can't replace we can't replace completely our technicians either um so I get their point that it's nice to outsource as much as possible. And it's great to be able to have certain things. Um, but some of it, your cytologies now, come on, guys, we can do your cytologies. <laughs> you know, like, that's not hard. I even get to the point of like, the whole urine sediments. Um, the fact that we have to relook at most of these urine sediments is kind of sad too. So I'm not completely sold on the SETI view, even though I know a lot of people love SETI views, but the fact that we're having to like relook at a lot of them is kind of like, well, is it really worth it when you have some really awesome technicians who could look at a, a sediment pretty quickly if you actually gave them the practice that they really need to be able to do it really well? We have to, you know, empower our our credentialed technicians to be able to let them do their job, you know. So I I can understand if we want to outsource some of the stuff to IDEX or Antec or whatever, but like use your money wisely in your business. Do we need to outsource ear cytologies? Come on. So yeah. But Everyone can manage their business the way they want, right? Um, so here's like a good one, right? This egg was de- detected on a flotation for um, a feces for a three-year-old barn cat. Um, so how did the cat become infected with this parasite? Okay, so essentially you have to de- detect to yourselves um what is this parasite roundworm right not a roundworm why is this not a roundworm is what? it a tapeworm why is it a tapeworm <laughs> let me think about it what made you <gasps> sorry my dog's being so rude it's okay i have rude animals what what about this looks like a round or a oh gosh a tapeworm? I'll give you hints right here. You can see the the stage of where it's at, which is probably the worm itself, or the stage of the egg, right? No. What are these yeah, things like- right here? The uh, embryo. Embryos. What are these things? Uh, 
I have no idea. <laughs> They're the hooks, the hooklets. So they always come as the same numbers, like three mm -hmm. or four of them? Yep. So you guys can see my document, right? Can you see my Word document? No? No. 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 Okay. I was like, eh, let's see. Um, so if we have Dublidium caninum, which is another type of tapeworm, right? There are all these little ones in here, correct? They're all gonna have hooklets. Yeah, I'm used to seeing the tapeworm look like that. This public, that the other one looked. It had. It looked similar. It looked more similar to like a roundworm almost. I mean. Yep. So there's three different tapeworms for for um small animals right so that's diblinium caninum we have another one okay and then we have another one that looks very similar to this so these also are going to have hooklets in there okay they have hooklets in there so we have tania is another one And then we have another one. What's the other one called? We don't see this one quite as much, but Echinococcus. Right? Echinococcus ends up getting those hyad cysts. So you'll end up seeing like those cysts inside. It could be anywhere. It could be most of the time like around the liver, sometimes it could be around the brain. So if you end up, you know, searching on uh, YouTube for hyad cysts, um, you'll see some crazy things where they have to take out hyad cysts. Um, and they could, if you break one of those hyad cysts inside the body, um, it puts that patient into anaphylactic shock. So you have to be really, really careful um, when removing it. So this patient, so this cat, most likely has which type of tapeworm? Is it the tania? Good, tania, right? So if we go back to this question here, Okay, the tania. How did that essentially? They're not asking, right? What? What? Ingested of the flea. Good. Yeah, it ingested the flea, right? So it's not that it it was bitten by the flea or whatever, but it was ingested by the flea, right? Very good. All right. So um, a five-month-old intact female barn cat, they're like all into the barn cats here, right? Um, has a cutaneous mass on the neck. Upon the exam, you notice an opening um, the mass. Has anyone ever seen this before? Yeah. Yes. Um, I really, really, really want to. Oh, gross. Okay, so the organism is removed with forceps. What parasite is this? Cuterriba. Cuterriba. Cuterebra, good. Cuterebra. Good, so the cuterebra is what? What is that? A larva, yeah. fly larva? Good, fly larva, very good. They're so gross. <laughs> so gross. Um. Okay, so what would be um anyone know what is our treatment for coccidiosis in cattle hmm. the first one okay 
No, I would say A and B. The A and B answer. Okay. I'll say metronidazole. <laughs> Why metronidazole? That would be a lot of metronidazole, right? Yeah. What does metronidazole treat? Diarrhea? Sure. Yeah. Yes. It's technically an antibiotic for the um, GI tract. Right? Okay. We used amprolium. So Corid is what I used to use. Yep. So who A and C is the one I want to say. A and C? Yeah. Okay. It's not an option. So. I was gonna say, I'm like, so uh where's that <laughs> option there? Okay. Probably A then. Okay. What is amprolium? It's an antibiotic. Oops. I'm being vague because on purpose, so for all of it. Because I want you guys to like make your own educated guests together on these. So <clears throat> so what do you think? I think it's A and B. A and B? What what is our third option? I'm sure you can use all three of all three drugs listed. Then maybe it comes down to like cost effect. Yep. And um, and what's the best choice, right? Yes. Which of the following are effective for treatment of clinical coccidiosis in cattle, right? So it doesn't say which are used, right? Or which is the best. It says which of the following are effective for the treatment. Yeah. So it is all three. Oh, that's sneaky. <laughs> <laughs> That's sneaky. Yes, that is true. Sneaky wording. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um. Ooh, let's look at this one. Cats infected with Dirofilaria emetis. What? Routinely develop severe reactions to administration of monthly heartworm preventatives due to rapid death of microfilaria. Are usually microfilaria emic, allowing diagnosis via knot or filter test or examination of wet mount of whole blood. Usually develop disease due to aberrant migration of the worms including to the central nervous system ocular tissues often harbor harbor sorry large numbers of adult worms have not been shown to develop any significant clinical disease due to infection um the last one no, I would say that often um, large number. Yeah, I'm going with second to last because cat, it's it's more rare and it's really rare in cats to get that. So do they harbor large numbers of adult heartworm? No. I feel like it's option three. Oh. From what I remember, yeah, cat, it's, it's very it's rare in cats, it's, but treatment that you would do on a dog isn't as safe for cats. It's it it, I think it can kill them, so we treat them with monthly preventative, um, and the vasodilators to to help start. I think killing the adult fleas or killing the the. Uh, 
the babies I, I can't remember the name of them. microflaria yeah. yeah the microflaria that's that's kind of what i remember every time we get a heart warm positive dog they always be like oh it sucks for if a cat gets it because cats can't have this treatment they can get really sick and and it's contraindicated is kind of basically what they always say to us hmm, yeah so that's what i'm kind of trying to find out what fits this question answer i mean I would say number two, because they're not the correct host for heartworms, so they wouldn't develop fully, right? Um, hmm. They're not the correct host, yes. Usually a microbiome allowing diagnosis for not Like they wouldn't just come up on a regular antigen test, like a. Oh right, okay, yeah. Um, allowing diagnosis via not or filtered test. Examination of wet mount of whole blood. Oh, I want to go with the occasional developed disease. Is it? Because they say when the cat has it, it's usually too late when they start to show symptoms because cats don't really. Okay, so occasionally develop disease due to aberrant migration of the worms, um, including to the central nervous system and ocular tissue. So what are you... Are you guys thinking that the third one is that's the answer because it says occasionally develop disease? Or are you thinking that why do you guys think that that's the right answer? Because cats are not the definitive host. So it's not uncommon for parasites to quote unquote get lost. Okay. So read that answer, um, except the words occasionally develop disease. What does that, that say? Apparent migration. Okay. Migration oh, of the words, including the central nervous system or ocular tissues. Do those worms travel to the central nervous system or ocular tissues in cats? Uh, yes. Yeah. No. I don't, really? I don't think it does. No, because they go from the bloodstream only? The bloodstream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. I don't like this question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so the first one, routinely develop severe reactions to administration of monthly heart run preventatives due to rapid death of microfilaria. Okay. Like reactions and like how, like coughing, things like that, or like having reaction to the prevention itself, or? That's it. Uh, I don't know. Doesn't say. You do you guys treat cats currently with uh, heartworm prevention? We and... recommend it. Okay, you recommend it, right? for monthly mm -hmm. preventative, but then if they are infected, because it says cats infected with diaphylaria emetis are routinely, like routinely develop severe reactions to administration of monthly heartworm preven preventatives due to rapid death of microfilaria. Are cats going to have a severe reaction to microfilaria? Or are they gonna have more of a reaction to the actual doll heartworm. No, I don't think there. Sorry. I don't think there is even a heartworm preventative for cats. 
<gasps> no. <Yeah. laughs> really? There's there, 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 there is. There is. Revolution. There is, yeah. Let's start plus. Yeah. Or We're back though plus. Let's start combo. Yeah. Revolution. Let's start combo. Yes. We don't they're... have hard form here, so. Where are you no. at? Where are you at? Where do Me? you live? Yeah, where do you live? Uh, On Vancouver Island. Ooh. Do you guys have yeah, um, mosquitoes? We do, but we haven't had any heart form yet. Yeah. We neither. So right. fingers crossed. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, wait. We're going to look that up. Heartworm in... Who else said we don't have... We don't have it in Alberta. I'm in Alberta, Canada. Um, only so far... Uh, British Columbia can have it because they have a, a rather warm, humid climate and Ontario. Okay. But all the other provinces, they don't have it. In Alberta, we can't even get um, a hardworm snap test. What? what yeah, it's still, you, you, can, you, you can order them. Yeah. But um, it's it's not, I needed a snap test, test for my externship and I could not get one. We would have to have to order a complete pack, but yeah, nobody has it in clinic because it's just not a thing here. That's okay. special. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're going to look that up because they have heat maps um, on here for yeah. where heartworm is. So, yeah. um, okay. So where was I here? Okay. So, um, <clears throat> all right. So that's not the answer. Da -da -da. Um, so that makes sense why you have no earthly idea. <laughs> okay. So um, occasionally develop. Nope. That's not the answer either. Often harbor large numbers. No. Cats get maybe one um, heartworm, right? Because again, you're right to the person who said they're not we're, they're not the, the the normal host. Y'all know that humans can also occasionally get a heartworm as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we are like cats in that sense that we can fight off a heartworm. So if you guys have, if you live in a state that um, has a significant amount of mosquitoes and dogs who have heartworm you too it's not just dogs who are getting heartworm but it's that we too if we get bit up by a bunch of mosquitoes that are have heartworm we too are getting that heartworm each all the time right that is in could affect us but our bodies can fight that off typically however um, once in a while, there could be a person who just can't fight that off. And so, um, they will get a heartworm and then they probably make the news or something. I don't know. Uh, so, so yeah, um, that's why it is important again, that with cats, um, that they, you know, as a preventative that we have them on prevention okay it doesn't matter to you if they're indoor only or whatever because we get mosquitoes inside as well um all right have not been shown to develop any significant clinical disease due to infection all right do we see cats with clinical symptoms or even dogs sometimes it's not oh, no. always very common okay So the last is true because you can't really, because you have so little heartworm in them, it's probably hard to see in a diagnosis test. Yep. So we can do 
this one's kind of, this is a tough one, right? So mm -hmm. now whoever said this one, um, we, we are still going to see microfilaria, right? This is saying that we aren't going to have microfilaria. Right, because it's saying it's microfilaria emic. So that's like the opposite. Now, if um, so um, but. We can do a knots test, um, which is our filter test. Okay, super, super old, 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 old test, but still works great. Um, and then throw it on a wet mount. But we can also, we can't do our ELISA test with this, right? Why can't we do an ELISA test with cats? What does the ELISA test test for? Test the antigen. Okay, so what it where does the antigen come from? Doesn't it come from like the female heartworm or something like that? And the, then they only get the male heartworm. Typically, yeah, if we we have a, a male heartworm, right? So if they only have one heartworm, right? They have one heartworm, that means that they haven't reproduced anymore, right? If they have a female heartworm, they're probably going to reproduce. That's how it ends up, right? So if they have one heartworm, that means that they haven't reproduced anything because they can't, okay? So if they have one male heartworm, they're not going to be able to do an antigen test or the ELISA test because they can't pick up that antigen, okay? So what can we end up doing? What do you guys, test. Like we can do the knots test, okay? Well, what else can we do? But an antibody test. An antibody test, okay? Okay. Now, if we only have that male heartworm, what if we have a male heartworm? What are they able to reproduce at all? Male only? No. Okay. So what's microfilaria? The, the babies. The babies, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we are going to be microfilaria, Enoch. Okay. So this is right. Okay, so again, we're down to which is the best answer here. Um, have yeah. not been shown to develop any significant clinical disease due to infection. What is significant clinical disease due to infection? Well, Let's get kind of broad statement, right? If I were to answer this, my best answer would be this. This is a really hard question. I originally had gone with the last one because like I've never really seen a cat show like the coughing or like the difficulty breathing things like that versus dogs I have seen them do that but not mm -hmm. cats so that's why I originally went for the last one so we can have animals go into heart failure we can have them uh, throw a clot uh, and you not know. So that's where I'm going with that. 
Um, and that's why we highly recommend them beyond heartworm prevention. We actually had a, a dog yesterday. I'm in Ohio and he was a four-year-old male intact German shepherd. And he came in for uh, diarrhea and vomiting. So we, of course, and not up to date on vaccines. So we tested for parvo. He was negative for parvo, um, but he actually turned out to be heartworm positive. Mm. Um, and then he also had mega esophagus and aspiration pneumonia. So it was the wham, bam. Thank you, ma'am, for that. But um, it okay. was, he never really showed any signs of like, um, like, were like if he would like for the heartworm positive never like was in distress of um like his breathing kind of thing but something cool yeah yeah switch to Canada You're going to have to help me because I don't know. Um, no, it, it just states that there is um, the second low risk. Like it's the two, the two light orange guys up there, mm -hmm. which is basically uh, British Columbia, um, Alberta, Saskatchewan. Yeah. Where um, are you on this map? I'm in Alberta. I'm, um, uh, I'm uh, on the right side of that squiggly line in the in the light orange part up here. Oh no, hold on, hold on. On the left side. Okay, okay. So I thought that was all of all of North America. Um. So yeah, oh, there's here. British Columbia, there's Alberta. Yeah. So yeah, yeah I we I I have both. not seen a dog with hardworm or a cat with hardworm in Alberta. Like it's really hard to even get get snap tests. Oh. Hey Beth, I have to go. I thought we were ending a half an hour ago. No, you're fine. Yeah. Um, you guys are good to go. So if the, if there are people that I have to leave, it's totally fine. Okay. Um yeah, so this is why I kind of like this because it is, you know, it's hard because when we say that we haven't seen anyone with heartworm, um, it's like, if you're not looking for it, then it's hard to know if you've seen it, right? So yes. like, um, you know. And it's funny that on this, on this map here, because Ontario is marked as the second lowest, whereas we, we know in Canada that Ontario come summer, um, hardworm tests are just flying out the doors yeah, mm -hmm. because they're just so, so many cases of them. So I'm surprised to see that it's, that it's considered as a low compared to Alberta and British Columbia Brit with British Columbia being high. So here's the other thing though, they, they're flying out the doors doesn't mean mm -hmm. necessarily how are they how are they doing their prevention right well everybody in ontario like ontario is big on preventative so yeah. um yeah whenever we say okay are you traveling are you going to ontario or british columbia yeah. you know start your dog on a preventative whereas right. alberta we're like okay if you're staying within the province you, right. you don't need it so and that's where it might be like we've become here right. used to be yeah in, in a higher higher risk area right mm -hmm. now they've become very good with their preventative yeah. over the time yeah where maybe some of these areas have become a little bit more complacent right. over the years right and so yeah. now it's like oh goodness Right. And and the world is changing as we know mm -hmm. it. Like, yeah. you know, we all know that we have things happening globally that like the environment is changing yeah. and our bugs are staying alive for longer <laughs> and they're becoming mm -hmm. what we know is almost even like super bugs, right? That like yeah. fleas are living 
um, year round and takes our living year round where they weren't like that before. Yeah. And so it's now like, that's why I like these heat maps because it's mm-hmm. like, okay, you know, 20 years ago, it was just not the same as what it is right yeah. now. So what do we need to do to like, maybe we need to do a little bit more preventative in some of our areas, you know, oops, um, yeah. and everything. I'm like, I wish I knew where everything was in Canada so that I could be better, <laughs> but I don't, unfortunately, I don't get to travel to Canada. Um, yeah. But same thing for, you know, the United mm-hmm. States, like, um, of course, down here is always going to be harder because it's hot and humid, right? Yes. Um, yeah. You know, I live in Illinois and it's, um, it's hard because we pick up a lot of animals from down here. Um, mm-hmm. And so we, we end up inheriting um some of those animals that have heartworm disease. And so we're seeing a lot of those cases. Plus it does our weather changes a lot too. Yeah. Um, here is a lot better because it's colder and they've mm-hmm. gotten a cold control over prevention. And they've, you know, all these, all these places have done a great job of like getting that under control. But as you mm-hmm. can see, it's more of the map is like, okay, we're going from hot to cold in preventative yeah. here. Yeah. I think what we have is these areas are farming and, you know, again, uh, just a more or less of people just getting that um, uh, preventative type of thing. Animals just not being necessarily on prevention as much, maybe even in Alaska too, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, same thing. So you guys can even look at heat maps for, it's not just heartworms. So you guys can look at, um, oh, here, um, intestinal parasites. Okay. So, um, again, this is nice because now we have parasite prevention, even within our heartworm preventions and all of that. Um, so, you know, I'm in Illinois. It's like, how did this happen with we're like out of, <laughs> you know, but if we can get people on preventatives um, for heartworm treatments, then that might be nice. Um, yeah. Also, we have Chicago and a lot of people live in, you know, apartments or just their own sp- spaces out here. There's a, it's a lot more rule. And so they're going to have a, a lot of those types of things. So I think that's where we have to look at it too. So, um, mm-hmm. Canada. Oh, here you can also look at Giardia. Giardia is like, Oh, we have lots of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So look at Giardia, right? Yep. Like it's insane. So we can look at Canada. Yeah. So how do we battle Giardia? Right? Like that's that's going to probably be or should be a huge focus mm-hmm. for us. Um because Giardia is no fun. Um we have flea tapeworm. That's also huge. You know, fleas are are obviously a big deal. You guys got flea tapeworms too. Um, it really shocks me seeing Virginia as one of the low states for having flea tapeworm. I feel like every cat or dog that comes in, the owner's always complaining about rice looking things on yeah. the dogs behind. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. Um, let's see. Tick borne diseases. So this makes sense, right? Up here, tick-borne diseases. Definitely on the rise. Yep. But it makes sense up in this area, right? Mm -hmm. Wooded areas. Um, well, we should have killed most of our tick eggs this this winter. We had minus fifty, so there shouldn't be much left. You would hope, right? But like yeah. I said, 
ticks are like crazy oh you know yes yeah um here for you guys you know it's still yeah. mm -hmm. you know we're getting there yeah um and then if you're looking at viral diseases so FELV um if you look at FIV Do you guys have a lot of outdoor cats in Canada? Yes. Okay. yes. We shouldn't Quite have, few, but yeah. we do. Yeah. Um, so FIV. Wow. Right. Now it makes sense. Down south, we we have a, a lot more cat outdoor cats, right? Um, I mean, I think we have a lot of outdoor cats, period, but down south we're gonna have a lot more cats. Um, F E L V. Okay, kind of spread out a little bit more. So, and then, but I like to, if, like here it can tell you, you know, that how much is being tested. Also, you can go to certain years. So if you wanna go back, what did, what did it look like 10 years ago compared to now? You know, that kind of thing. So I, I think this is kind of cool to just look at too, if mm -hmm. you guys are interested. So um, what I like on here too is if you are um, um, going to your parasites, so they're all organized by each individual thing. So you can look at all cestodes if you want. You can look at all the coccidias. But say we're going to Kytotiella, you can see like what the life cycle looks like. You can see pictures of it, the stages of itself, what the disease looks like, um, the pre-patent period, um, you know, treatment for it, um, those types of things. Um, obviously the prevalence, so you can look at this side too. Um, if you want to go to, so one really good one to know is, where is it? I'll just pick this one. This one's a good one to know. Um, so again, just kind of going over the life cycle, you can see what everything looks like, obviously. Um, and then all the stages to it. And what that disease actually looks like. Um, and the pre-patent period and the treatments for it, of course. Now, granted, you know, for the VTNE, you're not going to necessarily need to know, okay, it needs to be on panazaril um, at 10 milligrams per keg, you know, that type of thing. Um, but the really important thing to know is, you know, like who it affects. Is there an, you know, uh, an intermediate host or who's who's essentially the host to it. Um, what is it affecting? Like, is it affecting a red blood cell? Is it a red blood cell parasite? Is it a, you know, does it go to a different, um, can it migrate? You know, those types of things. Where Where is this animal going to get it? Is it something like um, a cestode or a nematode or that type of thing. So kind of the general things about that parasite. Can you identify that parasite based on a picture like we talked about? Um, that type of stuff. All right. So definitely take a look at those things. Um, like I said, um, we're going to go over next week um, animal care and nursing. So it's going to be on like nutrition and 
um, behavior things, and we can still go over some um, parasite stuff if you'd like um, next week too, if you guys have questions on what you guys are learning um, as well. Um, we'll go over some arterial blood gases and that procedure next week. And then I'll also go over urinary cast next week too. I'll have a note as well so that you guys get that um, since we get, didn't get to it today. Um, but yeah, let me know if you guys have any questions um, for me throughout the week. Um, but yeah, thanks for spending extra time with me this week. Thank so. you. Thank you. Oh, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Of course. Do you know when the syllabus will be updated? Yes, I'm going to get that done right now and I'll repost it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, of course. I had a couple questions about scheduling. Yes. Um. So I had taken a break over the holidays just because I had a bunch of Christmas commissions and stuff um, from the class um, and it was just hard to keep up with everything. 